All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight is part three and our final part of our look at the Mahavidala Sutra, this uh, great series of questions and answers. <clears throat> so this is uh, Sutta number 43 in the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. Uh, we started this sutta two weeks ago, and I'm gonna do a kind of a, a little mini review because there's a few things that we need to remember. And then we just have one little section left, but it's pretty dense. So it'll take us through tonight to discuss. So the first thing that I'll mention or to remind you of regarding this sutta is that, you know, it's kind of a, I would even call it like a, a mini Abhidharma. And I mentioned this the first night. I mentioned it last week. There's a kind of a whole genre of like, Buddhist texts, Buddhist literature. And that genre is basically defining the Dharma. So it's not the teachings of the Dharma that are found in the sutras. The Abhidharma is about defining exactly what did the Buddha mean when he said an aggregate, for example. So the Abhidharma is these like definitions <clears throat> and more lists. And so we started noticing that that's what's happening in this sutra. This Maha Kutahita has come to Shariputra and is asking these clarifying questions. What exactly does this mean? What exactly does this mean? And then asking for some, you know, how many conditions are there for this? How many factors are there to that? So even though it would seem like this is just a collection of questions, I did want to remind everybody that there is a structure to this. Like there is an order and the order is actually very, um, well, it's very useful. So the first question is about wisdom, pranya. And what, what does it mean to be wise? What does it mean to not be wise? And Shariputra defined wisdom as knowing the Four Noble Truths, knowing suffering, knowing the accumulation of suffering, knowing the cessation of suffering, knowing the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. If you know those things, that's called wisdom. If you don't know that there's suffering, if you don't know it's about its accumulation, if you don't know about its cessation, if you don't know the path that leads to its cessation, that's called not being wise. So that kind of sets the stage. But then the next question is about vinyana, consciousness. And after defining what consciousness is, the next question is, well, then what's the relationship between wisdom and consciousness? Are they the same thing or are they different things? So this begins this kind of um, uh, process. So it starts with the idea of wisdom, then consciousness, then sensations, then perception, and what I kind of just want to point at is that we're exploring sensory experience in that way, from consciousness to feelings to perception and all of that. And then there's a few more steps that I, you know, we, we can, you could go back and check out the other classes, but I want to dwell for a moment because we did eventually, we got to the first jhana. So that first kind of deep meditative state. And I want to remind you, what is it to be in the first jhana? Well, it's to be quite secluded from sensual pleasures. 
secluded from unwholesome states. And then one enters this first jhana, which is and has thought, applied thought, and sustained thought. And it's also very pleasant, rapturously blissful. Now, there's a few kind of follow-up to that, but I just want to point that we've already been told about this first jhana, which again is really, it's full of sukha, and that word is going to be important tonight. So the first jhana is full of bliss, of sukha, not dukkha, not suffering, but bliss. And that bliss, it's brought about by, by removing oneself from sensuality, from sensual pleasures in that way. Now, the next section after that, and I think we are to understand that when we move to the next section, which is about the five faculties, the five senses, I think we are to understand that we are in that first jhana and we are exploring the senses in that first jhana and we are realizing kind of what, what constitutes the faculties, what constitutes the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, what are, what are they based on? And that's when we got into this inf interesting conversation last weekend about this idea of vitality, ayu, and then ushma, this heat, and the relationship between these until we got all the way down. And if you have this particular version, I'm on page 392, that's where we got all the way down to this ayu samskara, this habit of of being alive. It's not the heart beating. That's a, a kind of a later manifestation of this ayu samskara. And the thing that I want to write, remind us of, because the next thing is the last section that we're going to talk about. So this section on the vital formations or the ayu samskara it culminates, this section ends with the attaining, or the, I should say, the entering into the Samya Vedana Nirodha, the cessation of perception and feelings. Now, the thing about it is, I know that in Dharmadors we talk a lot about this meaning we talk a lot about meditation out in other worlds of Buddhism. There's a lot of talk about meditation, of course. And there's often kind of, um, or, you know, I kind of often get this question. I'll put it to you that way. And the question is sort of about, like, I guess, let me put it to you super simply. The question is about eyes open or eyes closed. Like when I'm experiencing these meditative states, are my eyes open and I'm like seeing things, but I'm having these experiences or are my eyes closed and I'm in a kind of state of sensory deprivation? I often talk about the idea of states of sen sensory deprivation. A quiet room, closing your eyes, not eating anything. So sensory deprivation, depriving the senses of stimulation. But again, the question often comes up of like, you know, what's, what's the experience of these states like? Now, obviously with the first jhana, we have a description of what the experience is like. It's blissful, it's joyful, you're secluded, all of that. The thing that I want to draw your attention to that I think is kind of important 
in this uh, penultimate section here on the vital formations, when they're talking about this really deep meditative state, the cessation of perception and sensation, I want you to notice that the conversation or the question that's being asked to Shariputra here, if, if I may kind of just summarize it, the question is, What's the difference between somebody who's in the, the Samya Vedana Nirodha, the cessation of perception and, and feeling? What's the difference between that and a corpse? <laughs> if they're asking that question, <laughs> they're asking that question because it, I, at least I would interpret that to mean that somebody who is in the cessation of perception and feeling Nirodha probably looks like they're dead. No movement, no activity at all. And they're asking the question like, well, what's the difference between that and a corpse? And the only difference, or there's like two differences, but the difference is this underlying habit of vitality. And it's this kind of like... Um, you know, it's that, I'll use this analogy. You know how when like the battery on your device or something dies, but there's still a little bit of juice in there that can like get it turned on one more time. Well, that's this kind of latent um, ayu samskara, this, this vitality habit. And this section makes a point that the meditator cannot feel the ayu samskara. They can't sense or feel this underlying habit of vitality. And it says that because if they could feel it, that would be a sensation that they're feeling in this deep meditation. So there's this kind of uh, when you're in sleep mode, so to speak, in this deep meditation, there is still this ayu samskara, which is what kind of will eventually bring you out of such a deep meditative state. I say all of that because now we're moving to the last section. And the last section is called, well, I'll give it to you in terms of the translation here, but we're moving to the last section on the deliverance of mind. So in terms of this sutra having like a, a progression or an arc, we're moving to this kind of ultimate state of, well, there's a lot of words for this, of course, in Buddhism. Tonight's word is vimukti. The root, this is the same kind of root word as moksha or mukti. Um, all of these uh, Sanskrit Pali words that mean release, liberation. So vi vimukti is the opposite of being kind of like bound. It, that's why they will speak about being like liberated, freed, or something like that. And tonight... I do hope we're going to get through this section and we're going to have a really clear understanding of what it would mean to have a liberated mind. I don't, I'm not making any promises tonight about liberating your mind, but I think we'll have a clear idea of what it would mean to have a liberated mind. Okay. So now let's talk the real word. So the real word, and actually let me, let me read the beginning of this for you. So this is our, our one monk, Maha Kuttahita, asking again the wise Shariputra, and he always refers to him as Avasu, friend. So he's saying to Shariputra, friend, how many conditions are there for the attainment of of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. 
there are a lot of aspects to that sentence. How many conditions are there for this? So that's the first question is how many requisites are there? How many conditions have to be met in order to arrive at the aduka, adukama saku, sak, <laughs> it's this aduka, asuka, cheto vimukti samapati. So let's break that down. So we're going to kind of start at the back of that. So tonight, everything that we're talking about from this point forward, we are talking about samapati. So S A, it's a long A, S long A M short A, P A T T I, pati. And a samapati is an attainment. And we'll do more talking about that word attainment. For right now, simplicity's sake, an attainment, it, we're basically talking about like, you made it, yay, you you got there. You, you attained this liberation of mind. Again, I'm gonna have more to say about attainment, but for now, that's what it means. So how many conditions, what are the, how many requisites are there for the attainment of this no dukkha, no sukha, chitta vimukti. So this liberation of mind, so chitta, but it's chitta vimukti, but it, we're talking about the chitta, the mind being vimuktied, being liberated. But it's a particular kind of chetto vimutti, a very particular kind of liberation of mind. And I say this because tonight we're going to talk about four different liberations of mind. But at the end of the sutra, one of the last questions is about are these four liberations of mind different or are they just four different names for the same thing? So keep that in, you know, in the back of your mind for now. But tonight we're talking about these four different liberations of mind. And the first one we're going to talk about is the liberation of mind that is beyond dukkha and sukha. So that's our first liberation. Oh, and by the way, at least according to this sutra, this particular attainment, samapati, this particular attainment of a, of a liberated mind beyond dukkha and sukha, this is the fourth jhana. So... There's going to be a few liberations of mind, and this first one is what is called the fourth jhana. And the question again is, how many conditions are there? How, what are the requisites for attaining such a liberation? Friend, there are four conditions for the attainment of the nine, neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. Here, with the abandoning of pleasure, sukha, and pain, dukkha, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to upeksha, equanimity. These are the four conditions for the attainment of the neither painful nor pleasant deliverance of mind. So we're going to focus on that one for a little bit. We got to establish some basics. 
and then we'll move on to the next one. So this is this fourth jhana that's beyond sukha and dukkha. If you haven't heard it lately or you haven't heard it from me, I always like to remind everybody that in Sanskrit, you have these two kind of polar opposites, dukkha and sukha. And of course, you know, dukkha, that's suffering, right? And then sukha is the exact opposite, bliss. But I like to remind everybody that there is this compound term, sukha dukkha. And sukha dukkha is a Sanskrit word describing the entire range of emotional experience. And so dukkha and sukha are the the you know the ends of the spectrum with all the other things in between of course so we are talking about the worst and the best in that way um yeah and if you and if you don't know that the it has a very interesting etymology sukha and dukkha the root of both of the root of both those words is a kaha k h a which is the root of the word for an axle of like a, a wagon or a cart or even your car. And in terms of your kaha, the axle, you can have a really nice, smooth ride, provided that your axle is sukaha. It's a, it's a sukaha. It's like a smooth axle. You don't want to have a dukkaha. You don't want to have an unbalanced, out of joint axle because then your wagon's going to be all. Ticka, 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 ticka. You want a nice, smooth ride. So, sukha is that nice, smooth ride, and dukkha is that bumpy, rough road in that way. So, what I'm getting at is, is this. In the first jhana, and I want to I'll, I'll, I'll always clarify, this is as I understand it, but in that first jhana, there's this development of sukha, and there is the transcendence of dukkha. You're out of dukkha. You're in a blissful, smooth sukha state. But why are you blissed out? Why are you in a state of sukha? Well, in the first jhana, you are delighted, you are blissed out because you have removed yourself from the sensual world. Now, the thing about that is, is that normally we receive pleasure from things. We get pleasure from watching things. We get pleasure from listening to things. We get pleasure from smelling things and eating things. We get pleasure from being touched or being in a hot shower or just having the body be pleased. But the point is, is that normally pleasure comes from things. And that's what puts us in a habitual mode of pleasure seeking because we are in a conditioned habit of needing and depending upon externals in order to get, to get that pleasant feeling. Now, for many of us, we are so conditioned to receive pleasure externally that way that we actually don't even know how else to do it. How, how else does it work? And what that means is, is that when the mind is so conditioned to receive pleasure from externals, if you take that conditioned mind and you remove it from sensuality, meaning you put it in seclusion, that mind, that conditioned mind, will probably get bored, but probably be uncomfortable. And my point is, is that 
a, a mind that is so conditioned from receiving pleasure from externals, if it doesn't have externals, it's not going to be happy. And that can, again, can manifest for different people in different ways in terms of, again, boredom or frustration or anything like that. And so it might require a little bit of changing of your habits and you might need to recondition yourself. And that's where meditation, a meditation practice comes in. The idea is, is that you practice sensory withdrawal. And now by withdrawal, maybe it's eyes open, maybe it's eyes closed. It doesn't really matter right now because what I'm talking about is sort of just not attending to sensory stimuli. And then a form of meditation, of course, is what we would call introspection, looking inside. And of course, within the world of Buddhism, as you may know, there are these four foundations of mindfulness, these four levels or four focuses for meditation, beginning with the body, then to bodily sensations, and then bringing the attention to the mind, and then bringing the attention to thoughts themselves. So my point is, is that normally we're on the lookout for pleasures out there. We do a little bit of retraining of the mind, and again, for some of this, might, this might take a while, but through enough training, through enough reconditioning or you know deconditioning, it can happen that. So I don't. Maybe this has happened to you, just in 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 life in general. It could possibly happen that. Maybe you've, ha you've, you've had a really, really busy day. Let's say maybe you, you, had to, you had to write a lot of emails. You had to respond to a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, um, maybe a lot of, uh, maybe at work, there's a lot of uh, demands being put on you, a lot of pressure. And maybe like you work in an office that has like really bright, fluorescent light bulbs that kind of bother your eyes a little bit. And, you know, maybe you live in a big city and you got to get on like a busy subway car to get home or, but what I'm trying to create is a, a, a world and a, and a situation where it's like really bright and really loud and really busy. And then you go into a nice, quiet, dark space. And your mind goes, oh. And it's, it feels pleasure from not seeing something or hearing. In fact, it's, it's, play, it's pleased from the lack of anything to attend to. Well, what I'm getting at is, is that the first jhana is described as this sukha, as this bliss, but it comes from not engaging the sensory world. And that th there's a, an, uh, a moment where, and now hear me out on this one, there's a moment where you taste a sukha, you taste a bliss in this state of sensory deprivation, and it makes you realize all of that other sensory stuff isn't bliss. All of that actually isn't pleasant. And if you get to that point where you recognize that the, the quiet, that's what's pleasant. When you realize that the sensory stuff is not it, that's understanding the first noble truth. That's understanding this teaching of suffering, which is to say, no, no, all of that sensory stuff, that's all annoying, actually. All of it. I know that the conditioned mind thinks that some of it's good and wonderful and some of it's like annoying. 
it's all annoying. <laughs> Whereas that peaceful, quiet place, that's sukha. So the first jhana is blissful, but it's blissful because of this withdrawal. Now, our text doesn't really deal with the second and the third jhanas. It just kind of dives right to the fourth jhana. And since we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, we're going to jump right to the fourth jhana. But the first thing I want you to notice is that the fourth jhana, this liberation of mind, it's the liberation of mind that is beyond dukkha and sukha. Ah, so notice we've gone even further because it was liberating to be freed from this need for stuff in order to be happy or in order to be pleased. It is a liberation to not need that stuff. I I kind of often describe this. It's like a, a, a way that I try to uh, sell Buddhism in that way. But it's about what if you could just be happy? I mean, like on demand. Well, if you keep needing X, Y, or Z in order to be happy, you will never reach the state in which you can just be happy because you will always need something to be happy. Ah, so it's a tremendous state of liberation to not need anything in order to be blissed out, to be in sukkah. But we're going beyond that to an even more enlightened state that is beyond both dukkha and sukkha. So <clears throat> the requirements, because that was the Mahakotahita, the question was, how many conditions are there to get into this fourth jhana, this liberation of mind? Well, you have to abandon sukha. Obviously, you have to abandon dukkha. And, and it doesn't really mention it, but back when we were in the third jhana, which they don't mention being in the third jhana, but back when we were in the third jhana, there was a disappearing of joy and grief. Not sukha, or there was a disappearance of sukha in that way, but they're talking about this kind of like happiness and sadness. And happiness and sadness disappear in the third jhana. It's why the third jhana is described as this kind of equanimity in that way. It's not, it's a very emotionally balanced. But then there's this abandonment of even the sukha and the dukkha in that way. All right, before we move on to the other liberations of mind, any questions about fourth jhana, no sukha, no dukkha, liberation of mind? Good, because we have very interesting things to talk about. So, friend, says Mahokotihita, how many conditions are there for the attainment of the animita cetto vimutti samapatti? So, how many conditions are there for the attainment of the characteristicless liberation of mind? what they translate here as the signless uh, liberation of mind. And I will use that language because I know that it's a very common language to find in Buddhist literature, the idea of signless. But we will, of course, talk about what, what that is. Um, well, let's read the answer real quick. Shariputra tells us, friend, there are two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all signs and attention to the signless element. 
These are the two conditions for the attainment of the signless deliverance of mind. Okay, so this is probably my favorite deliverance of mind. I do a lot of talking about this. If you've been to Dharma Doors, you've heard all of this before, but let's talk about it in the context of this. So this is a different chetto vimukti, a different liberation of mind. I want to remind you, the Buddha is going to talk about how these are all the same thing, but they're not actually all the same thing. But in terms of this one, this is the animita, no nimita, the no nimita liberation of mind. So a nimita is a quality or a characteristic. It gets translated as a sign, and that, that word sign, you know, it has a really complicated history in Western philosophy and like Western semiotics and the study of language, like that idea of a sign. And that's why a lot of translators like to use it. But a nimitta is a quality of something and these qualities are visual qualities like the color, shape, size. They could be auditory qualities like being loud, being quiet. They could be olfactory qualities or characteristics uh, like being putrid or being floral. A taste is, of course, a nimitta in terms of how something tastes, how it feels. All of those are characteristics or qualities. And what we need to be thinking about in terms of characteristics or qualities, characteristics, uh, uh, nimitta, they are what we use to differentiate this from that. If two people were talking at the same time, I would differentiate that person's voice from that person's voice. I wouldn't think it was just one person with a really weird echoey voice. I would differentiate it into the two voices based upon the qualities of that voice. So characteristics or qualities, nimitta, are how we determine what something is in that way. Now, this particular meditation or this particular deliverance of mind is about no nimitta. How would you achieve such a state of mind, a mind that was characteristicless in that way? Well, by two ways, not attending and let me get the language right here. Yeah, non-attention, non-attending to all characteristics. That's the first condition. And then the second condition is attending to, so paying attention to, the animita dahatu, the dahatu, the realm of no nimitta. Okay, so before I show you a few things, we need to talk about the whole eyes opened, eyes closed thing. So there are at least two ways to understand these uh, deliverance of minds, these meditations. And I basically, I'm going to keep using this simplistic language of eyes open, eyes closed. And what I mean by that is one way of sort of cutting off nimitta, of not attending to characteristics, close your eyes. <laughs> Be in a quiet room. Don't burn any incense, right? Keep it uh, neutral in terms of the smell. Don't eat anything. Um, 
make sure the temperature in the room is not too cold, not too hot. <laughs> now, if you did all of that, in other words, if you went into sensory deprivation and you actually closed off the external sense doors, well, there would still be a sensory organ going. There would be the mind yapping away. And so let's not forget that in the world of Buddhism, there are six sensory objects. Visual forms, sounds, smells, flavors, tactile objects, and thoughts. And thoughts too, which as you know are called dharmas. Thoughts have nimitta as well. They have qualities or characteristics. Otherwise, how would you know this thought versus this thought? One thought might make you sad. One thought might be nostalgic. One might thought might be scary. One might be exciting. So thoughts or ideas can have characteristics. So my point is, is that even if we closed our eyes and our ears and went into sensory deprivation, there's still plenty of nimitta to attend to. And of course, many of us spend a lot of time in meditation just attending to those mental characteristics in that way. Now, in one interpretation of this, in order to achieve these states of the deliverance of mind, you're getting close to the state of a corpse, as we discussed, meaning you are shutting down mental activity, you're shutting down bodily activity. And so you would reach this sort of deliverance of mind where there just aren't any characteristics Nimita to attend to, <clears throat> meaning the mind has calmed down, and the only thing, the only thing on the mind is this no characteristics ness. <laughs> okay. So that's one way to understand this animita cetto vimukti, right? This signless or characteristicless deliverance of mind. Now, one of the things that I love to remind or mention to everybody, this particular liberation of mind, this particular one, actually there's two, actually there's three, but we're going to we're going to run into them in a minute but these particular deliverances of mind especially this one about no characteristics this is one of those little meditations <clears throat> that in the pali tradition in the hinayana this pops up every now and then <clears throat> It's like fourth jhana pops up all the time. The Buddha always wants you to get into the fourth jhana. But a really deep deliverance of mind like this one, the characteristicless one, it's here. It's in the original tradition. But it's one of these things that just pops up every now and then. But this characteristicless idea becomes foundational for Mahayana Buddhism. <clears throat> and so I'm, I, I want to tell you quickly the Mahayana understanding of this liberation of mind. And it may, it may very well be that this has always been how to understand this. Or this might be one of those Mahayana like advancements in that way. <clears throat> So you've seen it a million times. You've seen it from me a million times. But it's about an object like this. And the thing about an object like this is we can talk about two things. And I'm always using this as my example. But the thing that we want to do is, is how would you know 
that this isn't this. <laughs> like, why are you not confusing them as the same thing? Oh, they have different characteristics. So for example, regarding these, we could say that this is the big one and we could say that this is the little one. Those are characteristics that make this one what it is and this one what it is. We could also throw in there the characteristic of being dark colored and the characteristic of being light colored. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we have the characteristics of the size and the characteristics of the color. We could do more, but I'm just going to use those. And the thing that I want you to pay attention to, so this is the big one, right? And this is the little one, right? So pay very close attention to the big, this big cup, right? Wait a minute. I thought this was the big cup. It looks little to me. This looks like a big cup to me. But wait, you told me this was the big one. And right there we realize that the characteristic of being big or little is not owned by the object. Size is not an inherent characteristic of something. And I want us to pay very close attention to the language I just used now. It's this question or this idea of the size being inherent, inalienable. But I just showed you that this can either be a big cup or it can be a little cup. And the bigness or the littleness isn't here, but it's not here either. The characteristic of size arises, it's relative. Einstein was right. <laughs> so <clears throat> size is relative, but the important thing that we need to know or, or keep in mind about that it means that the characteristic of size, it's not here. It's not inherent to the object. Let's do another one. Dark cup, light colored cup, right? Dark and light. Now, now color has to be inherent, right? Like this is really the, the light colored cup, right? Right? This is the light one. Oh, but this looks darker to me. I thought this was the light colored one, but now this is the light colored one. Oh, it's almost as if color is relative as well and not inherent to the object. Well, if you keep examining the nature of characteristics, just keep looking around at characteristics. How about this one? I always, I, I always like to do this one. Am I old or am I young? And of course, if you've been following my little lesson right now on characteristics, you know I am not young or old. But you put me next to a child and you would say that I'm old. You put me next to a nonagenarian, and all of a sudden I'm the young spry guy. Now, I know that you might still think that there's an inherent age to this, but look more carefully at that. Let's say that I'm 50 years old, but isn't that only relative to the Earth-Sun relationship? And so relative to other time situations, I would be a different age. And so all of these characteristics, we can, again, upon further examination, 
we can understand that they are not owned or housed or possessed by the object. And if you keep thinking this way, what you will realize is this doesn't have any characteristics unto itself, inherently. Any characteristic will always only be relative to other characteristics but those characteristics that it's relative to will in turn also be relative. What I'm getting at is, is that you could slip into a meditative state by meditating on the characteristic listness, the lacking of characteristics of things that you think have characteristics. And if you did that, you would not be attending the nimitta. And if you then were attending to this characteristiclessness, which is a very, very subtle place to put the mind, because it's that weird zone of, again, it's the zone of relativity, that Einsteinian relativity where nothing is fixed. It's all relative in that way. And so what I'm getting at is, is that that zone where everything is relative, that's this animita dahatu, this zone or realm, this dahatu of the characteristicless. And again, I promised tonight, not to necessarily liberate your mind, but to point at what a liberated mind would be like. And what we can kind of do is toggle between a mind that is responding to characteristics as if they are owned and housed by the object itself. We could toggle between that mind that's responding to characteristics. <gasps> Look, a black cup. But there could be the other mind that's meditating on the characteristiclessness of said object. And then that meditation could move you into this chetto vimukti, this liberation of mind. But what I want you to kind of notice is that being beyond sukha and dukkha, that's a little different than being in this characteristicless dattu, right? It, it's similar, and again, we're going to get to the part where the Buddha says, yeah, these are all the same thing. But I just want you to notice that there's a kind of feeling, you know, a, a vibe, as the kids say. Uh, there's a vibe to being beyond pleasure and pain, and there's a vibe to, like, characteristiclessness. Well, any questions about that one before we move on? And there will be kind of a wrap up of all of them once we've gone through them. So, yeah, no, please. It's it's actually a comment, but I'm I'm pretty sure that another word for signlessness or characteristiclessness is referencelessness. Oh, sure, we could go with that. And I I like that because it it kind of uh, points to the relativity part of it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, I think it's easier. I, I heard it recently in a meditation. So it's like, it, it, it it's, it's kind of easier to meditate, do as you're practicing as a meditation, because if you're like looking at a black cup and you're trying to look at it as though it has no color, that's really hard to do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. That I feel like a referencelessness would just need a little qualifying to make sense of it. But yeah. I like it as an G idea. Given this Dharma talk, I'm going with references. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, for sure. All right. Let's 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 read about another deliverance of mind. So friend. Oh, actually, uh, apologies. There's a little bit more to talk about in terms of the signless or characteristicless one. There's a follow-up question, which is friend. How many conditions are there for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind? So like, how do you prolong this? 
friend, there are three conditions for the persistence of the signless deliverance of mind. Non-attention to all characteristics or signs, of course. Attention to that signless or characteristic realm, of course. And the prior determination of its duration. And this we've actually already referenced a few times. Like for some reason, this idea keeps popping up. It's like a, a Darmador's thing. But this is the idea I mentioned probably last week, which is if you're moving into such a deep meditative state where you're going to basically turn off all mental activity and bodily activity, well, there's a kind of like almost a, a, a Newtonian karma problem. And I mean that literally in terms of like Newtonian physics, in terms of each action has an equal and opposite reaction. And so the question is, if you've moved into a state of nirodha, where there's no karmic activity, what could be the force that boop, pops you out of it? Every action is caused by an action in that way. And so I know how I got into the meditation, causally speaking, but once I've reached this state where there's nothing going on, how could there be a cause to push us out of it? And that's where we get into this interesting combination of the meditator setting before they even move into it, just like somebody who says, I'm going to get up in the morning at eight o'clock and they somehow set an internal clock. And sure enough, eight o'clock, they wake up. Well, the meditator is supposed to do the exact same thing by saying, I'm going to be in this meditation for X number of hours or however long. And that sets this little internal timer. And then if you go back to last week, the, the Ayu Samskara, that habit of vitality, well, that's what's kind of keeping the uh, circadian rhythms of the vitality that no in a couple of hours, we got to bump homie out of this. And so that's sort of the idea there. <laughs> so, so that's the idea of that, of how it's prolonged, is you have to set this internal timer. But then the question is, friend, how many conditions are there for the emergence from the signless deliverance of mind. Well, friend, there are two conditions for emerging, for getting out of this state. Attending to characteristics and not attending to the characteristicless dot to. <laughs> so basically you come back online, come back into the world of characteristics. That's how you emerge from it. All right. Noe, yeah, please. Uh, just really quick, it, it, we did this in one of the treasuries of, of mm. uh, things where we did the, the, the levels of meditation going all the way down to non. And then what happens? You come back up to the forest. Yep. You go down and down and down and down and up to the forest. And for me, that set point is the ringing of the bell that I'm always glad there's a bell because I'll sleep through it. I mean, I'll... <laughs> Indeed. Okay. So that's our second deliverance of mind. The first one is beyond Sukha and Dukkha. Second one is beyond Nimitta, beyond characteristics. And now friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind. And this is called apamanya. And this will be important in a moment. So the no pamanya, apamanya. So friend, the apamanya chetto vimukti, this, the immeasurable deliverance of mind, the deliverance of mind through nothingness. 
the deliverance of mind through emptiness, shunyata, and the signless deliverance of mind. Are these, are these states different in meaning and different in name? Or are they one in meaning and different only in name? Friend, the immeasurable deliverance of mind, the deliverance of mind through nothingness, the deliverance of mind through emptiness, and the signless deliverance of mind. There is a way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name. And there's a way in which they are one in meaning and different only in name. What friend is the way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name, so totally different from each other? Well, here a bhikkhu abides pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness for all beings in that quarter. Likewise, the second quarter, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth quarter, and so above all around and below, everywhere, and to all as themselves. They abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, metta, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without ill will, then they abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters, above, below, all around with a mind of compassion. They ab abide pervading one quarter with a mind full of mudita, empathic joy, two quarters, three quarters, four quarters, above, or below, and all around. And they abide pervading one quarter they abide pervading one quarter with a mind of equanimity. Likewise, the second, likewise, the third, likewise, the fourth, so above, below, all around and everywhere, and to all as themselves. They abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is called the apamanya chetta vimukti. This is called the immeasurable deliverance of mind. And what, friend, is the deliverance of mind through <clears throat> akinchanya, through total nothingness? Here, with the complete surmounting of the base of infinite consciousness, Aware, there's nothing. A bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. This is called the deliverance of mind through nothing. And I'm going to pause there because I want to talk about the next one in detail. So the immeasurable deliverance of mind, you've probably heard of before because these are often called the four immeasurable mind states, and they are the mind state of loving kindness, karunya, compassion, mudita, empathic joy, and then finally, equanimity or upeksha. And this is a kind of common practice in the world of Buddhism. Um, I hope everybody does it the way that it's described in the book, which is it's this going through the directions and then above and below and all around, but extending this heart of loving kindness, compassion, but to all beings and very much to all beings, just as you would to your own self, extending to all beings immeasurably. And the, the immeasurableness here, I, you know, there's a lot of different ways to understand the immeasurable, but I would really want you to think about a sort of um, 
a not so liberated mind that might be a little more directed in their loving kindness. Meaning, oh, I'm going to extend loving kindness to my grandma and these people, but not that jerk. No, nah, I'm not going to give any loving kindness to that guy. That's a very limited, measurable state of mind. It's what we're normally in when we're being so discriminatory. So this immeasurable extension of loving kindness to all beings, that's part of the immeasurability. So it's immeasurable in terms of the number of beings affected. It's immeasurable in terms of its scope. We shouldn't be limited by dimensionality in that sense. It should just radiate out infinitely in all directions. So that's a deliverance of mind to extend loving kindness and compassion. And this, I love, you know, it doesn't get spoken about enough, but it, the third one, this, they call it sympathetic joy or empathic joy, but it's about being stoked for everybody. Like kind of being really happy for everybody. And it's a really important part of this, a kind of joy in that way. And then that kind of evens out to this kind of just extension of equanimity to everybody. Now, that's this immeasurable liberation of mind. But then they just quickly threw in there this akinchanya, nothingness. And we're going to find out what something is in a moment, what kinchanya is, but this is the akinchanya, so no thing at all. And basically from everything I've read, from everything you know I've studied, this is a meditative state that basically the experience of it is, there is no experience of it. Because it's nothing at all. Re remember, it said transcending or surpassing, uh, completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness. So we're leaving consciousness way far behind with this one. So this is just a very, very deep nothingness. So I would call this like deep sleep mode in that way. And then this next one, which I definitely want to say a few things about. And what, friend, is the deliverance of mind through shunyata, through emptiness? Here, a bhikkhu, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, reflects thus. This is void of a self. Or, this is void of what belongs to a self. This is called deliverance of mind through emptiness or shunyata. So this is an important, um, for those that are interested in Mahayana teachings, and especially if you're interested in like Nagarjuna and Madhyamaka and all the kind of Mahayana teachings on emptiness, this is where we find the Theravada, the Hinayana, the early Buddhist understanding of shunyata. And I want to tell you right away that this teaching of emptiness, of course, it's another one of those teachings that's a lot like uh, characteristiclessness. It's present, it's here, but it doesn't get spoken about all that often. But then in the Mahayana, they take this teaching of emptiness and it becomes the foundation for their whole, the whole thing. Well, there's a little clue here for understanding the Hinayana, the Hinayana understanding of shunyata or emptiness. And what it is, is it's, it's about the meditator being eyes open. Experience, there's experience happening. But the bhikkhu is aware that this is empty or void of a self. And what that means is, and let me kind of try to you know, explain that clearly. 
it's it's one of those things that it's so subtle and in a way so easy to say but so difficult to realize and what it is 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 that the normal mode of thinking is thinking that all of this is happening to someone not there's an experience happening but that it's happening to someone. Again, it is such a subtle difference, but it's huge because one is basically what they call monoclichetta, a defiled mind that thinks this is happening to someone, or the other part of that, which is, um, so what the one contemplation is that this is void of self. This is not happening to someone. The other side of it is that this is void of what belongs to self. And so the other side of that is my ideas. Uh, oh, the things that I said. My cup. My hand. So there's one way of being, which is the idea that this is mine, my body, my words, my thoughts. Or again, there's that this is happening. This has arisen. This is so, this is such. Versus the owning of it, claiming it, thinking that it's happening to somebody. So this is basic, you know, um, Anatman, anatta, like teaching of self, no self. But I do want, like, especially all the like the Dharma heads out there, like people that really study Dharma, I want you to notice that the, the definition, and remember, this is like a mini Abhidharma. So the definition of emptiness from Shariputra is that it's a meditation on there being no self. What I want you to understand quickly is that in the Mahayana, what makes Mahayana Buddhism Mahayana Buddhism, by the way, is that not only is the self empty, all dharmas are empty too. In other words, for the Hinayana, there's no me, Michael, holding the cup. In the Mahayana, there's no cup either for a lot of the reasons that we talked about tonight regarding characteristiclessness and things like that. We won't get into them, but I do want you to know that a, a, if you want a, a, a really simple distinction between Hinayana and Mahayana, in Hinayana, the self is empty. Dharmas are real. In Mahayana, it's all empty. Okay. Any burning questions about emptiness. <laughs> All right, so let's get to the end of this because there is a just this beautiful little part at the end. So we have one more deliverance of mind that the Buddha mentioned, or sorry, that Shariputra mentioned. And it's, and what friend is the signless deliverance of mind? Here with non-attention to all characteristics, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the characteristicless concentration of mind. And this is called the characteristicless or signless deliverance of mind. This is the way in which these states are different in meaning and different in name. And what friend is the way in which these states are one in meaning and differ only in name? Raga. Attraction. That little stimulation of attraction. Raga. Is a maker of measurement. Vipada. Ill will or hatred. Or dvesha, I should say. Hatred. Is a maker of measure or maker of measurement. And the third poison, moha, delusion or confusion, 
is a maker of measurement, a pamana karanya. The word is pamanya karanya, karanya, maker of pamanya. Remember the apamanya, the the this Im immeasurable deliverance of mind. Well. The three poisons, greed, anger, delusion, or attraction, aversion, and confusion, those are all makers of pram pramanya. And it's measurement. So in a bhikkhu whose taints have been destroyed, these are abandoned. Greed, anger, and delusion are abandoned, cut off at the root made like a palm stump, done away with, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of immeasurable deliverance of mind, the akupa chetovimukha, the unshakable deliverance of mind, is pronounced the best. Now, that unshakable deliverance of mind is empty, void, of raga, devesha, and moha. It is devoid of anger, greed, anger, and delusion. Attraction or greed is a something, is a kanchanya. Hatred is a something. Delusion is a something. In a bhikkhu whose taints are destroyed, these are abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with so that they're no longer subject to future arising. Of all the kinds of deliverance of the mind through nothingness, ah, kim chanya, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind doesn't have greed, anger, and delusion. Attraction is a maker of namita. Attraction is a maker of signs. Hatred is a maker of signs. Delusion is a maker of signs. In a bhikkhu whose taints are destroyed, that have been abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, no longer subject to arising. Of all the kinds of signless or characteristicless deliverance of mind, the unshakable deliverance of mind is pronounced the best. Now that unshakable deliverance of mind, it doesn't have any greed, uh, hatred, or delusion. This is the way in which these states are one in meaning and differ only in name. So just want you to notice what happened there. So in terms of the immeasurable states of mind, Shariputra said, yeah, the three poisons, they make measure. And I would want you to be thinking of measurement as limitation in that they create limitations. So that's where you get this contrast between the immeasurable and the measurable. And greed, anger, and delusion, delusion make measurement. They also are something. Whereas the akinchanya liberation of mind is without anything. And then the third, this idea that greed, anger, and delusion are the makers of nimitta. And really, you can really think about like all of these in a really subtle way where it's like, oh, right. Like wanting, not wanting, that's all based on characteristics. I want the big cup of coffee. I don't want a little cup of coffee. So the wanting of the big cup is predicated on the big one, the characteristic of big, or there being something, or this, again, limiting or measurement aspect. So all of that brings us to the last term, I guess you would call it, that the Buddha introduced. This, uh, in Pali, it's akupya, or akupa, but it, you'll know it better in Sanskrit. It's this akshobhya. Akshobhya is this unshakable 
unperturbable state of mind. And it's what they're calling this kind of number one. What does he call it? Yeah, he says it's like the number one. Uh, it's pronounced the best. The unshakable deliverance of mind. Now, I want to remind you that the Buddha said all of these are the same thing. Right? All of these are just different names for the same thing. But in terms of their vibe, right, they all have kind of a slightly different vibe to them. Well, the unshakable deliverance of mind is really, I want you know, really think about this one. And what it is, is that they're talking about a mind that is kind of corrupted, stained with this attraction, this wanting, this craving, and this aversion, this bitter Ill hatred, get this away from me, I'm out so annoyed. So the mind is corrupted by attraction, aversion, and then is corrupted by that self we were talking about, that delusion that I'm doing this, or it's happening to me. So what I want you to notice is that, well, notice how perturbable a mind is if it's full of such needy wantiness, reactive bitter angerness, and these really confused ideas about self. <laughs> and now by self in that way, you know, we're talking about pride and talking about conceit and like all of those types of things. N again, notice how perturbable, how shakeable, you really just have to dangle a few things in front of such a mind, all right? And that mind is like, yeah, gimme, gimme, gimme. Ah, get that away from me. Where am I? What's going on here? What's the meaning of life? I'm so confused. So that's very perturbable. Let's start taking those away. Let's for a moment pretend, right, that we don't need anything to be happy. Let's pretend that we have fully cultivated Kashanti patience. And there's, we're not going to get angry with anybody. We have patience for centuries. And I, I, I have enough patience to just tolerate everyone forever. I don't need anything. And I'm very clear about the nature of self. I'm not confused about what's going on here. Notice how imperturbable such a state feels, like just thinking about it in that way. So let's kind of respect that unshakable state of mind as its own thing. But then also remember that it's the same thing as characteristicless, same thing as measureless, same thing as thingless, right? somethingless in that way. So it's the same, they all are talking about the same thing in that way. And so much of the Dharma, I'll, leave, I'll use this as my last little note. So much of the Dharma I have found is about being kind of flexible in these ways in terms of being like, oh yeah, they're all the same thing. But they are different. <laughs> like, they are, they're all different, but no, they're all the same. Like to be able to move in that way is an important part of the Dharma. So I just want to leave you with that comment. Any last thoughts or questions or ideas? This is a heavy session. Yeah, Maria, please. Oh, I just want to say it's so funny that that's your last comment because I've just been thinking about mentioning either here or at class that it seems like there's something about holding the teachings somewhat loosely because you if you hold too tight it it's you really just kind of get caught in in trying to sort of figure it out or or whatever. Um, it makes me, it's the same kind of feeling as for me as like when you're listening to someone who has a really heavy accent 
And if you listen too closely, it's really hard to understand. But if you hold it a little more loosely, you can kind of get the gist of what it is. So, yeah. Wonderful example. It also reminds me of um, like when you kind of know a foreign language and if you try to like actually hear every word, it gets too hard. But if you relax and be like, oh, you know, I know enough Spanish. Let me just allow. And then you're just, oh, I know what you're, I know what basically what you're saying. So, yeah. And that's a good example, Maria, that type of, um, it's a good example. Any other thoughts, questions, ideas? Yeah, no. I have two thoughts. Yeah. I love the Dharma talk today so much. Yay. One is that, uh, let's see if I can remember them both. One is that it it's almost like um, uh, the, 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 oh, shit. Um, the uh, uh, grasp, greed, hatred, and delusion kind of co-arise with the misunderstanding of things as having characteristics like it's it's i don't know which comes first you know they both either they contribute to each other right excellent uh, thought and then shit i knew i'd forget the other one <laughs> <laughs> i'll hold it loosely see if it comes back <laughs> yeah yeah all right noe oh just oh wow uh Thank you. Wow. So much, so much to take forth and, and, and to, to, to let go of. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Lakshana, Lakshana. Lakshana, so yeah. Lakshana. Right. Lakshana. The, the text, by the way, Noe mentions Lakshana. So the text was using the word Nimitta for characteristics or signs. There's another word, Lakshana. They're basically interchangeable. If you get technical, there's a slight difference between them, but yeah. So if you've heard me use the language of Lakshana before, same thing. All right, everybody. And that's going to conclude this Mahavidala Sutta. Um, so next Sunday night, we'll be moving on to a new sutra. Stay tuned for that.